Hello and welcome back. This is part two, everything you need to know about oxygen devices. And this is all about the high flow devices. So this is going to go into all the detail about the high flow, why to choose high flow. By letting you know how to choose high flow, you will then know which patients can go on the low flow devices. And you should have a better understanding after this really quick video. So let's dive right in. This is brought to you by Exam Facts, how to choose the correct device for each patient and ace that test, which is what you really want to know how to do, right? All right. So high flow devices, how to get it just right. So when we're talking about high flow, we are talking about being able to give that patient enough flow. And so as we go through this, I'm, there's a couple times I'll stop and I'll have you start breathing different ways. And this should help you understand it a little better. So let's move right along. So what are the magic words that I'm talking about here? There is a magical, magical word that talks about why the patient um, needs high flow and what we must always have in our mind when we are thinking about respiratory therapy and delivering our oxygen or our aerosol to our patient. And what is that magic word again? It is inspiratory demand. Now, why does someone have a huge inspiratory demand or a higher than normal inspiratory demand? What is an inspiratory demand? Okay, so an inspiratory demand is how fast does that patient need their flow, right? So let's imagine our non-rebreather. Our non-rebreather is a great, great tool. We talked about this. This is for our emergency situations, right? But let's talk about we now put this on a large basketball player. Yes, I know it's Michael Jordan. And we're going to put this on a basketball player. Do you think he's going to collapse that bag? Oh, yeah, he is. He has a huge tidal volume. His tidal volume, should he not be short of breath, is probably 1,200, you know, maybe even a little bit higher. So if he's short of breath, it's going to be even higher. So that's something we need to think about. Now, let's all, this is what I was going to tell you all. We're going to start to breathe. Okay, so if we take a nice, slow, deep breath, I'm going to take one with you. Oh, like a yoga breath, slow in and out. How fast did we want that flow? Not very fast at all, right? Now, we're short of breath. We're breathing fast. We're breathing 24 breaths a minute. We're, get, we're getting really short of breath. Start, start breathing fast, guys. I know I'm beginning a little breathy here, but I'm trying to do it for a purpose. How fast do I need that breath now? It's much, much faster, right? Need that flow. That flow, when I'm having a hard time breathing or I'm just very, very tachypnic, is what me what it means by inspiratory demand. So uh, we have to give that flow fast enough or we have to have a high enough flow. That's why the magic is 60 liters a minute. That should be good for most people. It might even be higher. We get some of these basketball players in there. You know, I've had times where we had um, huge firemen come into the ER and, you know, they were collapsing those non-rebreathers right and left. We had those things on flush on the flow meters. So you've got to think about that. It has to meet their inspiratory demand. Now, another thing is inconsistent breathing and high minute volume could be made up one of two ways, right? We have either a huge person and that's going to, that high tidal volume is going to make that high minute volume greater than 10 is the answer for the test guys. And high respiratory rate could make that minute ventilation go really, really high, right? So that's what you have to be thinking about with inspiratory demand. So the, the shorter of breath you are, I don't think shorter of breath is a real world, but you know, whatever. So the more short of breath a patient is, like that much better, I'm sounding a lot more teacher-like, um, is going to depend on how much flow you need and, and meeting that inspiratory demand. So inspiratory demand is the end-all, be-all of why we have to choose a high-flow delivery device for the patient. Now, if they're a very small patient, this little old lady, and they just need a little bit of oxygen, they don't need the high flow device. You know, they, a low flow device like a nasal cannula would work just fine. 
only those with higher inspiratory demands, inconsistent breathing will make, um, some of those breaths will be faster, thus they'll need more flow, thus they have a higher inspiratory demand too. So any kind of irregular breathing pattern in a test question would be something that you would want to make sure they got on a high flow delivery device. All right, moving right along. So, what are our devices that meet our inspiratory demand? Well, there's the Venturi mask, which we're going to talk about in a minute. There's the heated high flow nasal cannula, we'll talk about in a minute. And you're one that you're introduced most um, quickly in respiratory school is going to be the large volume nebulizer or a cool aerosol. So that large volume nebulizer, LVN, cool aerosol, there's a bunch of different words and these words change ring, um, regionally across the country. So sorry, you know respiratory. If there's one word for something or one acronym for it, there's 20 acronyms. So sorry, that's just the field. So ART, LVNs or um, cool aerosols will meet the inspiratory demands of the patient. We're going to talk about the caveats or the exceptions to that rule in just a moment. And don't worry, we're not going to do the math in the video, but the math will explain the answer to you. So you may want to embrace the math, math in this area just a bit. Okay, so that large volume nebulizer or the cool aerosol is a great um, way to meet the inspiratory demand. But let's look at that um, knob or the nozzle right here. And we have numbers, right? On that yellow one, you can see 40, 50, 60. The blue one, it's harder to read because it's written in white. And it tells you the liter flow you set it at to get that FiO2. So that's how that whole system works. And it's really good if you also need some moisture, but here we're talking about high versus low flow devices. So we're gonna stick with the inspiratory demand as a reason for choosing this device. Now, the caveat, the problem lies with the higher the FiO2, the lower the total flow. This is where that math um, explains your total flow. You get that ratio, one to whatever, you do 100 minus the FiO2, FiO2 minus 20 or 21, and then you can get your ratio. And the one is always liters of oxygen, and the second part of the ratio is how many liters of air is entrained. So on a lower FiO2, we're in, the, we're easily meeting the inspiratory demands. We're, we're doing 60, 70, 80 liters per minute on those lower FiO2s. If we are on the higher FiO2s, and it only makes sense to get more oxygen out of, device, out of a device, right? You're gonna entrain or suck in less air. It's that sucking in of air that adds to the total flow. So if we need 100%, not that they go to 100%, but you know, obviously that means you're sucking in zero air. So you're only gonna get the flow from the flow meter. Is a flow meter at 15 gonna meet anybody's inspiratory demands? No. So in these kind of cases is when you have to add that second flow meter. Anything over 60% is usually the test answer. You have to add that second flow meter to meet the inspiratory demands, that second aerosol system and tee it in. Okay, so we gotta remember this caveat with this high flow device. It's a magical, wonderful high flow device except for there are those limitations. The problem is it's a teeter-totter. The higher you go on the FiO2, the more total flow you are sacrificing. So the patient, if the patient's needing higher FiO2 because they're more and more shortness of breath, unfortunately, they're getting less flow and they're gonna be in training more and more room air, you know, if they're, if they're sucking in air around that aerosol and therefore they're diluting it. So it's a problem, it's a teeter-totter. It's something we have to deal with. Okay, let's talk about that Venturi. Now, this Venturi system is the same system that's on that LVN, on that cool aerosol. This is just the dry Venturi that we're, that we would, when we say a venti mask or a Venturi mask, we, we would be considering this dry system. But the same spacing on that cool aerosol or LVN is still a Venturi system. And what I want you to truly, truly understand about this system is these 
amount of air being entrained was created by engineers that are out there that figured out the exact mathematical proportions of the openings so that that guarantees that FiO2. So what that means is if it says put the patient on six liters a minute to get 40%, if you have them on eight liters, 10 liters, 12 liters, it's not going to give you more than 40%. The, it's perfectly engineered to be foolproof as far as over goes. As far as under goes, you can give a little less because you're not getting enough um, flow with the oxygen. But as far as over goes, it is foolproof. It is engineered by people smarter than you and I. These engineers literally created it based on trig, math, all those things that, yeah, we're just really not going to go into because really we, I can't go into them because I am not that smart. But that is how that um, you have to think about these devices. So these devices are kind of perfect in that they will always be precise. So when I say precise, that is the reason that you might choose a Venturi on a patient who may not have a high inspiratory demand. What? Okay. So if you need a precise, engineered, perfect, cannot be messed up, no matter what the nurse, family member, five-year-old kid does to that flow meter, it's still going to be precise, you would choose a Venturi, even if they do not need a high flow delivery system. So when we say precise, maybe we're talking about 28%. 30%, what kind of patient comes to mind when you think about that? I'll wait for you. Yes, absolutely, COPD. So a COPD patient, if you have a test answer, you're better off choosing a Venturi at 30% than you are a nasal cannula, because technically, it's still a guesstimate with the, the total flow. I know you were taught the equation, the equation's great but this is more precise because it is created by these engineers to be perfect and foolproof. Other people um, who might benefit from a venti mask would be just anyone who would need a pre precise FiO2, or if you're traveling with those patients that are on the aerosol, that would be when we would use the venti mask. Now, let's go to the modern day superhero of the high flow nasal cannula. Whether you went deep into your in on this in your classroom or not, this is on the TMC as of 2020. So if you are going to be taking the TMC and the CSC after this January 2020, this will be on the exam. So you must know about the high flow systems. So the great, great thing about these systems is, yeah, they're high flow. They're for reals high flow because you can literally set them, not having them in train, but the total flow coming out of the device is actually at those 60 liters per minute, 70 liters per minute, and you actually get to set it on the flow meter. So that is very satisfying. We talk about all these in theory, how much, um, how much flow are they getting? But here we're actually able to set these really high flows and it is so cool when you do it because you're like, oh my God, I just put that patient on 60 liters a minute. It's crazy. But they are able to tolerate it really, really well because of the total relative humidity. Don't you worry, we're not going into that today. That's just a whole other bag of madness that we don't need to start. But it's but because they actually have complete, especially the vapotherm. The vapotherm, I think, is absolute humidity. It's like perfect. You, they really tolerate high flows on that. So that is the high flow nasal cannula. It's kind of the 2019, 2020 superhero of high flow devices, and it is on the um, exam now. So make sure you know a little bit about it. And this is going to be really good because not only does it meet the inspiratory demand, but flow generates pressure. And 
so flow generating pressure, especially that high kind of flow, will give some kind of mild CPAP and increase FRC, and it should reduce shortness of breath in the patient. So when we use this in the pediatric world, you will we will adjust the flow based on the um, shortness of breath and, and give them more flow until they look more comfortable. We're actually augmenting that breath a little bit with the flow. Now, as far as these two devices, there are a couple others out there. They all are very similar. Um, the only real thing you need to know, and this is probably a little bit premature, if you're just now learning about devices, is you always want to wean your FiO2 before flow. That's kind of the only thing you need to know. So you would be setting these up on a certain amount of flow, and then they have that nice blender where you can actually choose a various FiO2, and it does go up to 100. So you are able to truly meet inspiratory demand at a high, high FiO2 with these easily. Now, when I say easily, it's still a lot of work to set these machines up, especially the VapoTherm. All right, that was a lot. I know it was a lot longer than the first one, but we had a lot to go over, and I really want to make sure you understood inspiratory demand. If you really don't know the answer, you should just shout out inspiratory demand to your teacher. It'll just make him or her smile because it's a really a concept that shows that you are understanding that you need to provide that flow to the patient to calm their work of breathing. It's a concept that goes all the way through advanced mechanical ventilation, guys. So really try to grasp onto it now. Thank you again. My name is Melissa. This is um, presented by ExamFacts, and that's all, folks.